which is the one that takes most time. And again, to reiterate, just for us to remember, it's about access, not ownership. When we're delivering our value propositions, if we can give them something to own, that's great. It's a bonus. A poster, a t-shirt, a bit of merch, whatever it is. Give away the music for free and maybe give them a bundle of other benefits. It's one way of, of approaching it. But it's about thinking, what is that bundle we're offering? What is that value we're giving to whichever segment it is we're engaging with? We're trying to be the green fish, not the gold one. Whatever we somehow we want to just stand out a little bit, somehow, because that's how we get noticed. Whether it's like Nate said, just going around and meeting everyone till he's just known. I know he's a green fish because I know Nate. <laughs> if I didn't know Nate, I wouldn't know he was a green fish. <laughs> so that's his way. By putting himself out there, people get to know he's different. And so whatever our difference is, or difference of our offer, we have to be aware of it in order to communicate it well <coughs> to whoever it is. Again, whichever customer segment we're choosing to do it for. This applies more for businesses than people, but I think this one's pretty relevant. It might not feel relevant. We hire products to do things for us. So we're speaking about access. There's a motivation for someone wanting to listen to Kanisha's music or Nate's music or Tommy's music or anyone else's music. There's a motivation, there's a reason why they want, they've chosen to buy Nate's and not mine. Probably because I can't sing and Nate can. But for whatever reason beyond that, there is a reason in their mind why. Something's resonated with them, something's touched them. And if we can understand a bit of what that is, it makes us a lot more informed in engaging with whichever segment we choose to. And again, remember whenever I say, the reason I keep saying that is because it's not just the fans. We have to get away from this thinking that it's just the fans we're trying to engage with. It's these other potential segments who can bring revenue streams to us, whether they be corporate, formal or informal. So I'm going to skip on to relationships. What sort of relationship do you have Describing the type of relationships a company establishes with specific customer segments. Which is why once we've listed all of them, we have to realize we're going to have a slightly different relationship with each of them. Whichever one we choose is going to be different. If it's a publisher, it won't be the same relationship as with a sponsor or an advertiser or a fan. It's all going to be different. <coughs> Each second, the mobile mouse has died. Here's something I want to show you. Now, in fact, I'm going to draw this because, um, oh no, Big D, she might have to go. Sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I ran out, Big D had to go. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> So, whoever our customers are, we have to think about where, where, where do they sit along a line. So forget the brands at the top. You've got acquisition on one side, you've got retention on the other. So let's imagine we're talking about, I don't know, our followers on Twitter. Any one time, what are we trying to do with them? Are we trying to get new ones? Or are we trying to keep the ones we've got happy? Can we do both at the same time? Why not be more systematic about it? So imagine we've got this line. I'll get a pen that works. Well, we we've got ac again. acquisition here. You've got to start with something, <laughs> yeah. Acquisition retention. So it's about, imagine it's a line that moves. So maybe we're more towards the retention at some parts of the year, some parts of the month, some parts of the season before we've got a gig. No matter what reason, we have a reason why we're trying to keep these guys happy rather than get lots of new ones. And then maybe for another reason, we're sliding back this way <coughs> to trying to get new ones. And it's about understanding where we are along that line at any one point and why. 
The same thing for one-off transactions and recurring transactions. Are we trying to get people buying something once or keep on buying? What's our model? Maybe we just want to sell tickets for this one gig. It's a one-off transaction. Maybe we want a publishing company to keep using our music for adverts. So we're trying to get recurring transactions from them. We have to understand what it is we're trying to achieve with the relationship with whichever segment we're engaging with. And here's another one, automated or personal. Do we want to make it a really personal relationship where we write our own tweets and take our own photos and it's really spontaneous, I'll take it right now? Or do we want to automate it a bit and use something like Hootsuite and just program when the tweets are going to be delivered or when the Facebook posts will go up? And certain times of the day we want it to have a certain tone and certain times in the evening we want a different tone. So we can automate it or make it very personal. Again, why are we doing that? And who's it for? That's what we have to understand. And again, this is just about being analytical about what you're doing and why, rather than just, just removing a bit of the randomness away, just being a bit more systematic. So, in business you have this thing called customer relationship management. Now, I think that the creative industry should be thinking in this direction too, because we have to maintain so many relationships now, more so than ever. So many different platforms, so many different social medias, we, we, medium we can use. How do we coordinate all that? What are we trying to do with them? So it's about identifying, attracting, and winning new customers or new fans, whoever it might be. It's about retaining the ones we've got and keeping them happy so they don't leave. And it's about reinvigorating relationships with former fans, former customer segments we let pass by the wayside. So these are three things our relationships should be trying to achieve. So this goes about saying, to have a successful music career, you need to have fans. You can actually get, get away nowadays of having the fans and no revenue stream, because a sponsor will pick you up just for having the fans. I've heard of a few stories this week of bands who, they had 20,000 followers. So Samsung said, OK, we'll sponsor you, because we like who your followers are. Question? Nick? You, need the mic? Yep. you might need the mic. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Um, I, so the, the thing about sponsors, I'm just curious, uh, would a sponsor sometimes offer f money instead of, like with Samsung, I would expect it to be a phone or a contract or something like that, but would, yeah, they actually offer, because that's yeah. something I haven't really explored. Your costs to, to do what you do, right. they should be funding that. That is interesting. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and to back up that point, Nate, um, if you have an awareness of what your costs are, which is where... We won't get to the cost structure tonight, but if you know what your costs are, how much does it cost me in a year? Maybe your costs equate to £35,000 a year, which above average salary in London, it's all right if you're getting that. You can make that and generate that. It's a good sustainable amount to start with. You can pick up a sponsor and say, these are my production costs and living costs, and they equate to this. This is how it breaks down. Then... Well, Samsung, as an example, they spend $800 million on marketing a year. So 35 grand is nothing to them. <laughs> it's nothing. It's no, they won't even bat an eyelid to pay that. In fact, they'll probably ask you, is that, is that enough? Are you sure you don't need more? If you've got the right fans that they want to engage with, then they'll make, they'll make that deal. You've got enough of them. Enough, enough of them. That's another potential customer segment you could engage with. That's another one. So I'm going to zip through these ones. I'm not sure how we're doing for time. How are we doing for time, Tommy? Let's say 10 more minutes. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Can you be online, the, the, the slides. PowerPoint. They will be, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And also, if anyone wants to get in touch with me to go through it as well, that's fine. I don't mind that. So um, I think I should go straight to revenue stream then, maybe. 
I had some great stuff about customer relationships, channels, but it's okay. We'll go through that. Boring. Boring, yeah, I know. Money, where's the money? Show me the money. <laughs> oh, here's one I am going to show you, though. Where is it? Just um, when I'm talking about customer relationships, this is, what, this is the loop you want to create with whichever customer segment you engage with, but particularly for fans. Awareness, that's where they start, that's where they hear about you, that's where they know what you're about. Then you want to bring them through to evaluation, they're listening, they're looking at your pictures, your videos, they're saying, I like him, I like what he does, I like what they stand for. Sorry, she, big D, she stands for. Then they go around to purchase, then they get around to delivery of whatever value proposition you're delivering to them. After sales, that's your feedback. That was great, that album you sent me. I love the poster that was signed that you gave me. I love that gig I went to, whatever it was. And then you want them to go back again to awareness. This is my next thing I'm offering or doing. And you want to keep people going round and round that. It's what we talk about when we talk about retaining customers. It's a loop, five steps. You want to keep them in those five steps. You want to know where they are in each of those steps if we're being systematic about this. I had some slides on that, but we won't have time to look at them. So I'm going to get to revenue streams. So this is the cash that an organization, by that I mean company, individual, however you define yourself, generates from each customer segment, each customer segment. So this idea you can have multiple segments, each bringing in a different revenue stream. So here's a few, here's a diagram with a few potential possible ones. Recording, merchandising, books, DVDs, appearances, other, touring, publishing, licensing. You might only need one of them to make that 35 grand or whatever you need a year to do what you do. I don't know if I have time to go through all of these, but I've, I found somewhere where there's 44 songwriter and composer revenue streams. So 44 methods. And ideally, there's, there's probably more. But out of these 44, maybe you only need two or one. Or half if you've got the right customer segment. If you get on board with Samsung, maybe you only need one of these. Or any, a sponsor who can move that way. So I'm not sure if we're going to have time to go through these. Tommy, you can... Um, let me know, but I can, I'd be happy to forward this, these slides on to anyone who wants them. I mean, you can go through the ones you think they're most relevant. Okay. <laughs> Streaming mechanical royalties. So is Spotify giving you nothing for thousands of people listening, but if you move that across several streaming platforms, it could start to mount up. And obviously, all of this links in with your distribution channels and your customer relationships. All of this keys in. Because you'll want to be pushing them to these platforms. And this one is very important because it's accumulative. Yeah. The more you create, the more, the more revenue you have from these royalties. Yes. And, and no matter, I don't know, for, for 100 years, probably you're going to have, you'll keep having royalties from this. Yeah. So this is about like, not expecting in a year to make, I don't know, $25,000, yeah. uh, like $20,000, dollars mm. but expecting that, you know, in a few years, you will be able to make, let's say, $10,000 just by, like, all the streaming royalties. Yeah, well, yeah absolutely. It's, it's, it's about, and it's also it's about breaking down that, let's say, $20,000. So your streaming royalties might bring you 2K. Your gigs might bring you in 4.5K a year. You're breaking this down into different streams and understanding what each one can potentially bring you in. And that's how you get this figure. You've got to break it down. You've got to understand it, what it's going to consist of. And that's why understanding what the options are is so important, as I keep banging on about, reiterating today. So, sorry, so Andre, I'm, I'm just going to um, articulate it like uh, with brevity. So we're, we're talking about having different revenue streams, not having just one. 
like selling CDs. Yeah. I, I think artists, they, they make this mistake, mm -hmm. uh, like myself included, right? So having one way of making money. So I think it's about exploring different ways of making money. And this is what, what we can see here. Yeah. That there's so many ways of making money <laughs> and finding the customers and then finding which one works for you and which one you find is better. Like Nate said, that he really loves having the Patreon thing as a main monetization yeah. way, revenue, right? So I think it's about having a div like a portfolio of revenue streams. That's, that's, a, that's a great word, a perfect word as well. It, it really is about that. It's, you have to think of yourself as me as this entity that produces this and I want to make this from it. How do I break what I do down into different streams of value that I get back, that I can collect? And it is about all of these methods. Like you're saying, Tommy, um, you know, record labels. There are, some, there are loads here I hadn't even heard of when I was going down this list today. Neighbor rights royalties for foreign performances. So you picked up on that. You're performing in Italy. Andre's performing in Italy and over here. So he can collect here and in Italy. Maybe they're also playing his music in Germany. Maybe he doesn't know that. Maybe he could also be collecting there. Again, another revenue stream. Each territory, another revenue stream. Salary, session musician, yeah, fair enough. Um, producer, music teacher, there's, like I said, there's, there's loads, there's lots here to look through. And um, we spoke about fan funding, I think Nate mentioned that with Patreon. Um, again, this is a massive area. Things like Kickstarter, Pledge Music, um, Indiegogo, Patreon, lots of platforms where your fans can directly bring income streams to you. And that's an important one, because think, if you can get that fan base and they can provide even a quarter of that a year, then it's definitely worth having that as a major part of your portfolio. So again, I can give that um, slide to anyone who wants it, because I don't think we have time to go through everything. I wasn't going to go through the business model of Spotify. I don't think we've got time, have we, Tommy? How am I doing for time? <laughs> okay. So, just so everyone understands how these streaming, streaming companies work, I'm going to zip through this very quickly. Spotify, their customers, global music fans, and advertisers. It's a very simple model. And effectively what they do is they create an automated online relationship with the global music fans, and they create communities around you guys' content. Distribution channels, internet, mobile, and PC, moving a lot to mobile, which is what everyone should be aware of. And revenue streams, very simple, advertising fees, strict subscriptions from mobile and subscriptions from PCs. They're different, and this is a good point. This is why I keep saying mobile as well, because did you know that an ad displayed on a laptop pays significantly less than an ad displayed on this or your phone. It's the difference between you getting two or three P per display ad, and that's premium on a laptop, or getting anything up to a pound on a mobile phone for that same ad being displayed. It's a huge difference. It will drop, don't get me wrong, as these devices start to become more, more seen, but it's why you see a lot of artists, another revenue stream which wasn't on that list, some artists are now creating their own apps. Because then they can display adverts within their app at anything up to a pound a pop. And there's platforms to make these apps for nothing. <laughs> you know, it's not, it's not hard. So it is about looking at these options. Oh, sorry, is there a hand up? <laughs> Has someone done it? Has someone done it? Can you come and say, come and talk about it? I think, I think that's. Yes, please. So. <laughs> It's called Mazevo. You as artists can go on 
Uh, build your own smartphone app, completely free. You put on all your photos, all your content. Soon it's going to be a new updated version in September where you literally just go on Facebook and it pulls in all your content from your Facebook page. So literally it's set up within minutes and you can share it out to your, your fans. So if you're a gig, for example, you just say, go on to Mazeva, I've got my own smartphone app and every single part of your content will be there. But you also have your own mobile site as well as your own smartphone app. Which means it works across platforms, right? Yes. There you go. So. How much of the ad revenue transferred from the Mazevo service to the new Mazevo That's not in play yet, nothing. Mm. So you've got, it's, it's, everything's free now for you. Yeah. It will be as well. You can, it will always be free, but you're, in, in the end you can have no ads for four ninety nine a month. Okay. And generally, I mean, it, as holds true in most parts of life, if it's free, then there's a reason it's free. It's not going to be free and allow you to make lots of money, but it's a start. It's a way to start building your audience. And then maybe you might say, I'm going to get pay someone to create an app, which now I can monetize. No. Just shift them across. But that's, can you not do that's that? another discussion. You'll get his Evo down <laughs> to have a proper discussion about this. <laughs> um, it, will, it will always be free, but they, it, there's more to it. But I don't yeah. want to give too much away because... Can you create revenue from it? This is what we need to know, though. Well, yeah, eventually, every, eventually. Yeah, anyone can create revenue from their app okay. themselves. That's, but that's, that's coming. There's I lots see, I see, I see. Okay. Many things. It sounds interesting. I've not heard Many of a visa. Many exciting things, everyone. <laughs> Do you work from a visa? No, not at all. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Cheers. <laughs> so there's one, Mavizo. But I mean, there are loads. There are loads. And some you pay for, some are free. And then there's people who will actually build your app for you where you can put in your own ads. You can actually connect with an ad server and get them to serve ads to your app and to your viewers. So there's many ways. And as I said, mobile pays a lot more for ad serving than if you have your content on YouTube and get for a thousand ads, I think they pay 70 quid, something like that, yeah. Might not even be that much. Depends as well, even that 70 pounds depends on the quality of the, of the people who are watching them. Yeah, yeah. So again, that's another way. <coughs> so, I'm gonna zip through the rest of this. Their offer, advertising, access to music via streaming and download services. So if you look at Spotify, they're actually not doing anything you can do with your own app. Because it's your fans. You bring your own fans to your own app. Except they're going, you're bringing your fans to their app. That's all that's happening. As a discovery thing, great. But why are you letting your fans enrich them? So they're doing advertising. That's, how they, that's their offer. And access to music via streaming and download services. It's an app and a website. There are resources, the licensing agreements. If it's your content or you connect with five other musicians to make an app, which is why I spoke about your key partnerships, maybe five different entities come together and you all put your content on there and you all share the revenue. And you bring all your fans to that one platform. So it's just taking their model and just hacking it for yourself a bit. So all the licensing is going to be yours. The platform and the brand is something you can build then. Software and network engineers, they're, they're out there. I mean, Elance, People 24-7, all of these platforms where you can get third-party employees to do things that you don't have the skills to do at reasonable rates. And then their partner network is the rights holders, labels, and publishers. Again, as I said, five entities, music entities coming together and creating an app can have their own network where they bring their own fans and monetize them. So all we're doing is just hacking their model a bit and making it smaller for us. So, Go on. attract so many people and probably make lots of money from it. How, yeah, how do they get away with it? Because I think they've, the, the deals they made with the labels um, means that the split is very much in favour of the labels. Mm -hmm. yeah. So could you, as an artist, 
have a deal with a record label where you make it specific about the sort of splits that you have on um, these sort of websites. Absolutely, yeah. You could definitely negotiate. In, in a way, when it comes to negotiating with labels, it's, it's never been more open. The days of, here's a contract, sign that, have gone a little bit. You, if you've got a bit of clout, you can negotiate and tussle a bit on it. You know, so, and it's always good to try. It's always good to try and know what you want and go into the room with, with that in your mind. That's what I'll always say. So, um, yeah, I would say every time, have an idea of, before you're speaking to a label, you should actually understand how much things like this pay. As part of your negotiation, you should know all the figures and have, or at least have a representative who knows all this stuff. Um, because it's just going to give you more power in that negotiation. First contract is a mug's contract. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's what they say. That's, that's what they, they say. say. That's what they say. Unfortunately, out of desperation, most people do say, give me the pen quick before they change their mind. Again, it's, it's this, this idea that's been created that people forget that the record companies need the artists more. And they don't really work that leverage much anymore because they're just grateful to have the offer the contract. Where the reality is if they really want you, they'll negotiate. They will. Depends on how queen you are and fish. <laughs> you liked that slide, didn't you? You liked the green fish. You're very much a green fish. Yep. I'm going to wrap it up. So I only got to um, one half of the um, canvas. So the backstage stuff that supports all of this, we didn't really get to. Remember, we spoke about the front stage and backstage. But let me um, zip back to my diagram. So give me one second. Okay. So we didn't really get to the backstage, unfortunately. Here's a little diagram just to um, emphasize what I said at the start. This front stage and backstage part, this is where the performance is happening. This is where your fans, your customer segments, whoever they are, this is where they connect with you. The stuff behind that is what supports all of that. So imagine it's a theatre. You've got um, the people backstage do the lighting, the sound, the <coughs> costumes, the stage management, the unsung heroes. That's the work you guys are doing behind the scenes to deliver your product to whichever customer segment you're delivering it to. And then understanding what all of that, how that translates to your performance and your connection with your customer segment and your delivery of the value to them and your collection of the value from them, whether it's money, plaudits, or whatever it might be. So these two sides of your business model and understanding both sides, the backstage and the front stage, is quite important. And I'll wrap up to say all of these available, all these slides will be available. But the thing I really want you to take away from this is making sure you understand the range of people you can engage with. And as a result, you'll understand the different revenue streams that are potentially available to you. And you will understand the value you'll be delivering to each of those people you're choosing to engage with. And these are the three important bits. And if anything, these two are the ones that really matter. Because if you keep engaging with the, just the fans or just the same people you've always engaged with, and you don't expand your fan base or expand your customer base, then you're going to find it hard to grow and create more revenue streams and capture more value. And what I'll do is, I don't know how long we've got, should I take a couple of questions before we finish and then? Um, yeah, sure. I was just thinking that um, I, I saw people today and I asked mm. people if they know any unconventional, unconventional revenue streams. Yeah. So I got some examples, I don't know if you want me to read them. Yeah. Sorry, 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 sorry. Um, so. Right. Meet and greet. I don't know what this might mean. Applies mostly to big stars. So that's when you go to some nightclub in Essex and 
Say it like, wave at someone from a balcony. I've done it, like, basically after a gig, or even like, I think if you have a bit of a following or whatever, after a gig, just say, merch stand, and then you go there. And because the artist is there, the people will buy more stuff. And most of the time, like, I work with an artist, and, you know, they would take maybe a, a few of the less expensive stuff away so they would buy the more expensive stuff and then they would sign that and then they would engage in and taking pictures so that would help also the social right. media and stuff. Okay. So okay. Fans are actually selling um, like special tickets to their gigs that yeah. include a meet and greet and they're stupidly overpriced and that's <laughs> I think that's what that probably means. Yeah. 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 There's no music being played it's just a chance to see yeah. this I think Avery Levine yeah. is like four hundred dollars yeah. or something. Yeah. Like but, but you know what? Used to even shake hands with yeah. She's like, you have to stand across the room from me. But, but you know what happens a lot of the times with that? We um years ago when Missy Elliott was big, and we were putting on this club night, and the record company rang us and said, um, she's in town. You know, she's she's it's a Tuesday night. She wants to be out there meeting her fans. Yeah. We we're like, fine, okay, um, great. Missy's gonna come down to the club. We promoted it. It's really popular. When she got there, something didn't look right with her. <laughs> Fake Missy. Oh. Apparently, it's very common. It's a very common practice <laughs> to send doubles in place of the stars. Yeah, exactly. Which is why she didn't want to meet anyone cl up close. <laughs> very common. It's been going on for years, apparently. The record label guy was like, "What's your problem? This is just, this is normal. <laughs> you sent us the fake Missy." Who's our brand you're messing with? I hope Missy got paid. Yeah, she got paid. She was in America. <laughs> she got paid. <laughs> she wasn't even in the country. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I, I think no, we don't really one. have let's enough time. We've been one. around like for two hours. So let's let's really recap and, and go for Okay, so online side collaborations. For example, guitarists pl uh, making instructional clips. Endorsements. Even if you don't get paid, you can save when buying your gear or you can cover your expenses. Premium merch, don't just sell CDs or shirts. Make them special, make premium versions or limited edi editions uh, that, for example, your hardcore fans would find valuable. Uh, this is not about ripping every anyone off, but recognizing how you can give something a little extra for someone who's willing to pay for it. Uh, by request, live gigs. For example, fans getting to decide the songs to be played. Metallica is doing this. Mm. And also there was a YouTube clip where people were playing jazz and there were like some cans and this was faster, slower, Lady Gaga, Elvis Presley. Okay, so people were throwing yeah. coins and they were changing in like an interactive way the way of playing music. Library music. If an artist has material that doesn't end up on records as songs that's good and it's good but catchy, it could be worth putting together material and try to sell material to companies that sell music in sync context. This way your song is part of, uh, of it and could end up in an ad campaign, which means you get paid. Plenty of users make a living of property. So they mm. invest the money on property and this has nothing to do with music, but they do. Um, ghost producing, and that, that was the last one. Ghost writing and ghost producing. Mm. What was mm. the one the, before? Um, make a living of property. Become a property developer, then make loads of money and play Basically, your music. I, mean, I, 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 I know <laughs> artists that have, they bought restaurants or property and they make yeah. a living out of this which is very profitable but they can make the, the music they want yeah. without any worrying about money so for this you could also put stockbroker lawyer whatever yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's get a job, <laughs> get a job basically get a job. <laughs> great so so just so we so we need to close the venue anyway right. um, so i think it's better if we do, if you have any 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 last words to say mm. and then let's do the thing like the takeaway so everybody screams and shouts what you remember what you wrote down, what, what is a really good idea. Mm. So we can, everybody can start thinking like, okay, this is what is quite popular. Okay. Um, well, I suppose I'll close it by saying, I mentioned at the start, um, I work for London Fusion. So if anyone would like to engage more with some business support for their, for their business, their music business or entity, um, or just have a chat about what they're doing and maybe get some advice or tips, then um, I'm quite happy to give my details after and anyone can get in touch at a later date. Um, in terms of takeaways, I'd say I didn't manage to get through the whole business model canvas for you, but I'd say the most important thing to me is understanding this idea of your fans are not the only customers you can potentially engage with and make this exhaustive list where you can see 
the full range of people, then make an informed choice about why you're doing things and who you're doing it for. And I think that's, um, if you can start on that point, then I think the rest will kind of fall into place because it will open up your options for you. I think that's it. So from the people that wrote down things, uh, what, what are the takeaways you have? Uh, Murray, you seem quite skeptical. I've written everything down. Right. <laughs> <laughs> what is the thing that strikes the most? Um, yeah, you know, working out who your, who your customers are and uh, working out what value you can provide to them. Uh, yeah. The role of music in um, people's lives. I just think uh, it's a good uh, fuel. It's a good source of fuel. Yeah, yeah. It's indispensable. You yeah. cannot get away with, without listening to music. Yeah, um, I, the big thing I, mm. I would say is being a Being a collective, uh, what you were saying about being a collective with Spotify and we were talking about with apps, uh, um, something we all do together, it's a big thing um, in terms of revenue streams. Um, I think that's an amazing thing that I took away from that today. Thank you. You kind of really drove home the importance of key partners today. Um, and the importance of people having to strategically, like events like this being a really good thing because we need to build contact lists and we need to build association with others in order to increase the value of each of us individually. Absolutely. Great. Any other comments? Yeah, I'm just going to say that um, there's something going on underneath that skirt. <laughs> I noticed that. <laughs> I think it's like, um, like you know, also knowing who you are. Like you have to work out who you are. So you have to, and by working out who you are, then you're gonna create something that reflects that, and then everything is gonna fall into places as a consequence. Mm -hmm. So it's pointless to say music is important, or like the music is all about. It's all about you because you're creating this music. So. Mm -hmm. It's just a reflection of who you are and you have to be confident that, okay, I'm cool and this people is going to want to buy in me because I can give them that or I can inspire them in some way because the music at the end of the day is just that, you know? Mm. So, yeah. Great point. Thank you. Right. Anybody else? Okay. Don't be shy. All right. So before we run, we run, a, uh, run the applause for, for Andre, so I would like to say that um, that was that was darker music talks, right? That was the interactive thing that brings together experts and musicians, people that know a lot of stuff and they can explain and talk for hours about something very specific that we really care about. And this is happening every month. So what's going to happen next is when you go home before I sleep, I'll send you an, e uh, an email with the contact of Andre with a presentation with the important things we talked about and probably some photos so you know what to, to read next and everything else. And I'll keep you in touch about everything we do for the next months so you can come over to the next events. This is a thing that is just, it's just us. There's nothing else involved. So this grows through word of mouth. So if you really want to help, the only thing you can do is talk about it, talk about the importance of having this community Bring your friends over next time and uh, stay in touch. And definitely we'll have a workshop in September about business models. So I'll send you an email as well, probably the next weeks. And if you're interested, we'll, we'll make this happen. It's going to be like a, a small class and we'll talk for a day about how we can identify all these things about our business. Uh, I would like to thank 90 Main Yard for the whole space they give us. That's amazing, and they're sponsoring the, the event, as, as well as London Fusion. And uh, thank you for being here. We'll go downstairs for a beer, and uh, a round of applause for... Thank you. Thank you, guys. And I'd just like to say, um, could you give Tommy Darker a round of applause as well, because this platform he's created here is, if you use it properly, this can really transform what you do.